Our story unfolds in a dimly lit alley where a group of stern men in suits relentlessly beat our protagonist. Despite suffering severe injuries, our protagonist, Park Kong Tai, manages to keep a cigarette dangling from his lips. Park Kong Tai, gasping for relief, pleads with his assailants, expressing the excruciating pain he feels. One of the men, seemingly more merciful than the rest, offers him a brief reprieve promising to grant him a moment to savor his last cigarette. Grateful for this small gesture, Park Kong Ta retrieves his lighter and begins to light his cigarette, extending his heartfelt thanks to the man. As the lighter ignites and he takes that first drag, an ember of hope momentarily glimmers in the darkness. The men discuss their brutal intentions, with one commanding the bald man to dispatch Park Kong Ta's brother swiftly with a single shot. The bald man reluctantly agrees and offers an apology to Park Kong Ta who, undeterred, simply spits out his cigar and stoically acknowledges that these men are merely following orders. He reflects on a life marred by anger and despair, his once promising boxing career forever disrupted. Park Kong Tai recalls the tantalizing promise of his youth, where his towering height, punching power, and star quality labeled him a rising star in the high school boxing world. Regrettably, he succumbed to provocations, resulting in the loss of his boxing career and a sense of unfulfilled potential. Haunted by the thought that there might have been alternative paths, Park Kong Tai wonders if he could have staged a comeback or found a way to make a living through boxing. Despite the futility of regret, the burning desire to return to the ring persists. He yearns for just one more chance to step into the boxing ring. Suddenly, a voice interrupts his contemplations, criticizing him for being a mere boxing apprentice. Someone calls him Kali, snapping him back to reality, questioning whether he's dead. Another voice dismissively proclaims they don't care if he dies, urging them to leave. Three boys hastily retreat, leaving behind a young man, bleeding and seemingly lifeless. Park Kong Tae's eyes snap open, and he gasps for air as he inexplicably inhabits the injured young man's body. He examines his trembling hands, fully aware that he should have died from the stabbing. He's left pondering the identity of this new body. Days later, Park Kung Tai learns from the men that the losers of a match are sent to the mine, while the victors remain at the August Boxing Apprentice School. Their instructor, Nick Sar, stresses the importance of training as if their lives depended on it, and assigns pairs for upcoming matches. The names are called, and the pairs are revealed. Torres and Meros, Undat and Bazan, Kizo and Damon, Johnny and Caesar, and finally, Solit and Kali. Nixar concludes by cautioning them about the impending match. The burly men respond with laughter, but the leaner members of the group turn to their captain, Park Kong Tai, and question whether Nixar's orders are tantamount to a death sentence. Park Kong Tai, now reincarnated as Kali, is acutely aware of Nixar's divisive intentions as he separates the inferior fighters from the superior ones. The prospect of being sent to the dangerous mine where accidents and lung diseases claim lives even in the 21st century, fills him with dread. Callie knows he must avoid that fate at all costs. Abruptly, Nixar calls Callie's name, causing him to jump in shock. Nixar instructs him to follow, as he has a separate task for him. Some of the superior fighters express resentment, speculating that Callie is receiving special treatment once again. Another superior angrily labels Callie as a jerk who can't keep up with training. Before we continue, Take a moment to answer the question of the day. Leg attacks or fists? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now back to the recap. Meanwhile, in another location, Nixar informs Kali that he has submitted his name for discharge. Kali is surprised but maintains a calm exterior. Nixar asserts that Kali is not cut out for boxing, given his small build, and suggests that the same holds true for the mine, or he would likely meet a swift demise. Kali contemplates the grim reality of his frail body and anticipates a life expectancy of less than a year. Nixar, however, offers a glimmer of hope, proposing to recommend to the owner that Kali be sold to a different master. Kali, with unwavering determination, informs Nixar of his intention to participate in the upcoming match. Nixar questions whether he truly is Kali, highlighting that under normal circumstances, Kali would have already broken down. Kali resolutely affirms his commitment to becoming a boxer and stares confidently at Nixar, who with a <laughs> smile concedes the point and assures Kali that he won't press further. He invites Kali to seek him out if he ever changes his mind. As Kali silently contemplates Nixar's motives, he acknowledges that he is not who he appears to be. Until recently, he was a gangster named Park Kangta on Earth. His reincarnation as Kali offered him a second chance at boxing, but he is painfully aware of his frail physique weak bones and limited stamina. His growth spurt came late, and his punches lack power. Callie suspects that his previous experiences of bullying 
were a result of his feeble body, leaving him puzzled as to why he was given this second opportunity. Suddenly, someone calls out to him, and the superiors fix him with hostile glares. Callie realizes that he is about to face another round of torment. Solid, one of the superiors, brutally punches him in the face and kicks him away, accompanied by a declaration of his disdain for Kali. Here are the changes you requested to replace C with Kali and make the necessary corrections. As Park Kang Tai, now reincarnated as Kali, stood his ground against the barrage of insults from the other fighters, Solit taunted him about bragging regarding his father's championship status, cruelly suggesting that he should simply die, as he was nothing more than a weak, insignificant bastard. Though the onlookers initially regarded him with pity, they were astonished to find Kali still standing, defying the odds. Kali couldn't help but ponder the wretched existence of the body's previous owner, and Solit teased him, claiming that he only had to endure that face for a week. Kali, maintaining his calm demeanor, humorously mentioned that it was because he believed he was destined for the mine. This remark infuriated Solit, who unleashed a powerful fist towards Kali. With his current frail physique, dodging seemed impossible. However, as the fist inched closer, Callie was amazed to discover that he could see its trajectory and managed to evade the blow just in time. The surprising display of agility didn't go unnoticed. Solid, even angrier now, attempted another attack, but Callie skillfully dodged it and capitalized on Solid's momentary vulnerability. With precise timing, Callie landed a punch on Solid's chest, causing him to stumble back. The other superiors watched in shock, and Solid, though shaken, retaliated by hitting Kali hard in the face. As the superiors walked away, Solit informed Kali that no one appreciated his cockiness. Alone on the ground, battered and bruised, Kali couldn't help but smile and laugh heartily. He realized that something as crucial as body weight in boxing was hand-eye coordination and reflexes. Kali recognized the importance of seeing every detail, following each grain of sand, and having the reflexes to dodge every punch. He vowed to survive, determined not to end up in the mine. Reflecting on his new world, Kali learned that the audience derived pleasure from fights where opponents were pummeled into submission, and his current body was more susceptible to injury. When a fellow fighter suggested slowing down if he was exhausted, Kali vehemently denied it, emphasizing that he was fine. He understood that lacking strength in this brutal environment equated to certain death. Nixar eventually called an end to their training, leaving Kali catching his breath and feeling frustrated that he couldn't run as well as he could when indulging in vices like alcohol or cigarettes. Nixar, observing Kali's improved performance, pondered what had changed and how Kali had progressed so quickly. Later in the day, Kali overheard two men discussing his unusual behavior after a head injury, and Nixar inquired about it. The men explained that they suspected Kali had been brutally beaten with signs of head injuries and bleeding. Nixar sensed something was amiss and decided to monitor the situation closely. During individual training, Kali noticed that everyone was giving their all to avoid the dreaded mine. He realized he needed to do the same but acknowledged the futility of his current training regimen. His weak body couldn't inflict significant damage, so he focused on perfecting his aim for the jaw, a vital target that could shake an opponent's skull and bring them down. When questioned about his unconventional training by a fellow fighter, Kali suggested a different approach inspired by his previous training camp experiences. The man dismissed him as cheeky and reminded him of the fighter's veteran status. Kali was well aware that the style of boxing in this place favored slugger types, similar to heavyweight fights in his world. He had trained in that style before, but his current weak body made regular training ineffective. Despite his physical limitations, a man instructed him to pick up a log and repeat the exercises. Just as he was about to start, someone intervened, grabbing the man's shoulder and asking him to wait. It was Nixar who questioned Kali about his training style suggesting that if it was something he learned from his father, he could incorporate it into their camp's training. Nixar recognized the potential value in the champion's training methods and encouraged Kali to continue with it. He pondered whether Kavan, whom he believed to be a champion, might have more training techniques to share. Nixar couldn't help but notice that something had changed in Kali since that day. As the sun began to set, Kali leaned wearily against a tree, realizing his physical weakness. His stomach growled with hunger, and he craved something sweet. To his surprise, he noticed an apple tree above him. He bit into one of the apples with delight, feeling rejuvenated by the taste of the fruit. However, his moment of enjoyment was interrupted when a noble lady approached him and inquired about his presence. Nervous and taken aback, Callie struggled to find words. The lady suggested that if he couldn't offer an explanation, he should at least pick an apple for her. She expressed her desire to eat one as well. Callie promptly climbed down and offered her an apple. She took a bite, complimented its taste, and asked if he was a slave from the training camp who was unaware that this was a noble family's garden. She warned him of potential punishment if he were caught, 
She introduced herself as Azalea August, the daughter of Baron Gadolf August, who happened to be his master. She instructed him to reveal his name, and he timidly replied that he was Kali. Azalea decided to overlook his actions for the day, thanks to the apple he gave her. However, she issued a stern warning that if he were caught again, she would personally administer punishment with a whip. She urged him to leave the garden quickly before others saw him. Grateful for her leniency, Kali thanked her and hastily made his exit, feeling relieved that he had narrowly escaped trouble. As Azalea watched Kali running away, she couldn't help but notice his small stature and how he appeared rather weak for a boxing slave. She held the apple he had given her, contemplating his name. Here are the changes you requested to replace C with Kali and make the necessary corrections. The following day, Kali was engrossed in his unconventional training, using only his hands while the superiors practiced with the log nearby. His transformed training style drew the attention of everyone around. He recalled the previous day when he had even struck solid, realizing that if this continued, it could spell his demise. Fueled by frustration, he angrily tossed the log he had been carrying and inquired about the instructor's whereabouts. A fellow superior informed him that they had been summoned by the master, which put a sinister smile on Solit's face, who viewed this as an opportunity to test his potential opponents in advance. Solit boldly announced to the group that he intended to establish dominance and singled out Kali as his first target. He planned to assert his authority by violently subduing Kali. However, Kali displayed remarkable agility by swiftly ducking Solit's attempted grab from behind. He turned to face Solit and launched his fist towards Solit's jaw, but stopped himself just in time. Surprisingly, Kali offered an apology, explaining that his intense focus had caused him to overlook Solit's presence. He genuinely inquired if he had accidentally hit Solit, expressing relief upon hearing that Solit was unharmed and advising him to avoid injuries before the upcoming match. Solit trembled with fear but vowed to return to his own activities. Kali, however, recognized Solit as a troublemaker and had encountered individuals like him during his time in the organization. He swore to himself that he would crush those who tried to act tough by belittling others. Meanwhile, another man diligently trained with a log, realizing that Kali's change in training style couldn't be a coincidence. He approached Solit, noting the pallor on his face, and inquired about his concerns. Solit defensively shouted at the man, asserting that he was fortunate to have Kali, whom he considered a weakling, as his opponent. The man acknowledged Kali's recent transformation, explaining that he had observed a newfound determination in Kali's eyes. This suggested that Kali was no longer the whining and submissive individual he once was. The man cautioned Solit not to underestimate Kali and to remain vigilant. Solit's surprised reaction to Torres paying attention to Kali left him in disbelief. Torres, wearing a smile, pushed Solit back, reassuring him that Kali was still the same person. He encouraged Solit not to worry and to follow through with the plan to send Kali to the mine. With confidence, Solid affirmed his commitment to the task. Meanwhile, at Godolf's mansion, a man informed Nixar that preparations for the match were progressing well. Nixar acknowledged that they had even started living at the training facility. Godolf inquired about Torres, the promising fighter Nixar had mentioned, and asked how he was doing. Nixar praised Torres, describing him as a fighter with a well-balanced combination of strength and agility, aggressiveness, skill, and a keen eye. He believed that Torres had the potential to aim for the champion title. Gadolf expressed his anticipation for the upcoming match and revealed his desire for Nixar to do something for him. Nixar inquired about Gadolf's request, and Gadolf explained that the training center's reputation had been declining, leading to financial struggles. To address the issue, they had been forced to send half of the slaves to the mines due to insufficient funds. Gadolf proposed inviting commoners as spectators to generate income as he believed they would enjoy watching the fights. He asked Nixar if he could put on a match that would captivate the audience. Nixar agreed to the request, all the while considering Godolf as his master, but harboring doubts about Godolf's competence. He remembered that the training center's reputation had declined because Godolf had overworked the boxers, leading to their deaths. Godolf had relied on the training center's income to support his family, but now even that wasn't enough. Nixar couldn't help but think about how things might have turned out differently, if Godolf hadn't sent young boxers to the Kingdom Boxing Tournament two years ago. He also recalled a man who had promised him victory, but had tragically died, leaving him frustrated. Nixar believed that without Godolf's decisions, the training center might have had a chance to regain its former glory. Azalea expressed her desire to watch the match and asked her father to prepare an additional seat for her. Godolf questioned her sudden change of heart, reminding her that she had previously expressed dislike for the brutality of the matches. Azalea replied to Nixar, stating that sometimes she found barbaric things intriguing as well. Nixar expressed concern that the brutality of the match might be too stimulating for her, but Azalea insisted on watching, 
equating stimulating with fun. Gadolf chuckled at his daughter's determination, recognizing her unusual interest in the fights. While she wasn't typically interested in such matches, she had a strong desire to witness how Callie would perform. The day of the match finally arrived, and Callie entered the arena, adjusting his hand bandage, feeling that the moment had come at last. As the crowd's cheers grew louder, someone raised their hand in the air, marking the start of the match. Torres found the match easy, and it quickly came to an end. Up in the stands, Nixar and Godolf observed the fight. Godolf praised the match and instructed Nixar to train Torres diligently, with the goal of making him a champion within a year. Nixar agreed to the task. The instructor announced that the next and final fight would be between Solit and Kali. Azalea, who had been watching the matches, noticed that everyone else was tall and muscular, whereas Kali appeared incredibly thin. She wondered how someone with such a small physique could aspire to become a fighter. Nixar explained to Azalea that for a fighter, physique was an essential factor, as physical strength directly correlated with power. Despite this, Kali had a plan, and Azalea observed that he seemed confident. As the fight between Solid and Kali began, Solit questioned Kali's decision not to surrender, warning him that if he fought to the end, he'd have health issues. However, Kali retorted that if his abilities matched his words, he'd already be a champion. He understood that the challenge lay in the vast difference in their physiques, and realized that simply hitting Solit's torso wouldn't cause significant damage. Instead, he needed to target Solit's jaw. To achieve this, Kali required two crucial elements. Solit launched his fist toward Kali, who skillfully dodged it. Kali realized that he needed to make Solit's upper body bend as it did now. He continued to evade Solit's punches, causing the viewers to shout angrily at him, accusing him of running away and calling him a coward. The pressure from the crowd provoked him, but he wondered why Kali seemed unfazed. Once again, Solit swung his fist at Kali, insulting him as a small bastard. Kali had devised a clever plan to handle Solit's relentless attacks. He intentionally made Solit keep coming at him, causing Solit to exhaust his stamina faster than Kali, who was mainly focused on avoiding the punches. Kali's strategy had two main components. First, he needed to wait for Solit to drop his guard to strike at his jaw, and second, he had to create an opportunity for himself to do so. However, Solit resorted to cheating by grabbing Kali's shoulder and launching a punch at his side. This unexpected move broke a few of Kali's ribs, causing him intense pain. As the crowd cheered for Solit, Kali wondered if they were aware of Solit's cheating, because he had used his bare hand rather than his gloves. The instructor initiated a countdown, and Kali struggled to get back on his feet. He managed to stand up just in time, despite the pain in his broken ribs. When asked by the instructor if he could continue the fight, Kali was determined not to give up. Having faced death once before, Solit threatened him, but Kali met his next punch with his head, causing Solit to cry out in pain and hurt his hand in the process. Kali seized the opportunity and launched an attack on Solit punching his jaw with all his might. Solit staggered backward, seemingly unaffected, and taunted Kali. However, Solit suddenly collapsed to the ground. The instructor began the countdown for Solit, and the bewildered viewers were left shocked and confused. When the countdown reached zero and Solit failed to stand up, the instructor declared Kali as the winner. The viewers couldn't comprehend what had just occurred, but Kali was simply relieved to be alive, determined not to squander his second chance at life. A week later, the slave traders arrived, and half of the apprentices were sent to the mine. The only exception among the inferior students was Kali. With just over 10 people remaining in the training ground, the training center fell into an eerie silence. At August's mansion, Nixar informed Kali that his shackles would be removed once they returned to the training center. It was Kali's first time visiting the mansion, so he took a moment to look around and acquaint himself with the surroundings. Nixar asked about the condition of his body, and Kali replied that he was fine. Kali then excused himself to ask Nixar why the lady had summoned him. Nixar explained that the lady seemed to be interested in him after his last match. A few minutes later, in Azalea's room, she greeted Kali and mentioned that they were meeting again. She ordered Nixar to wait outside for a while, and although Nixar was confused, he complied. Once alone, Azalea instructed Kali to sit and he initially declined. However, she insisted and told him not to refuse, adding that she didn't ask twice. Kali accepted and mentioned that he had heard she had called for him. Azalea responded by playfully throwing some fruits at him, telling him to eat. They engaged in conversation while he enjoyed the fruit she had given him, which brought a smile to her face. She explained that she had summoned him because she had something to discuss. She inquired if he was aware that slaves had no right to refuse to which he confirmed. Azalea praised his performance in the last match, commending his thin arms and his one-shot move. She mentioned that her father believed it was luck and coincidence. Kali clarified that it wasn't luck, and explained that when a punch accurately struck the chin, it caused the head to shake. 
temporarily causing the person to lose control of their body. This effect only occurred with a strong impact. Azalea asked if he aimed and attacked deliberately, and he confirmed. She praised his skills, expressing her anticipation of his future performances, and encouraged him to continue winning to become a professional boxer. She also hinted that if he became a champion, he might attain freedom. Callie looked at his hands and imagined the shackles falling to the ground, contemplating what it meant to be a free person. During the afternoon training session, Torres trained diligently with the idea of freedom as his driving motivation. He pledged to himself that he would definitely achieve freedom. When Torres was just 14 years old, Nixar had told him that he had the potential to become strong, or else Nixar wouldn't have brought him from the farm. With his natural physique and fighting spirit, Nixar encouraged Torres to work hard to become a champion and ultimately gain his freedom. At that time, Torres used to dislike individuals like Kali, who seemed to engage in aimless activities without a clear goal. However, everything changed when Kali unexpectedly transformed during his fight with Solid and managed to survive. This event taught Torres that life was unpredictable and one could never truly anticipate what would happen in the world. One day, someone suggested to Torres that they should teach Kali a lesson because he was acting cowardly. Solid had been assigned to go to the mine, and a man named Keo, known by the nickname Mantis, proposed that they beat up Kali. Torres, feeling indifferent and having let go of such grudges, replied that he was done caring about such matters. Keo questioned whether Torres genuinely didn't care, commenting on the boredom of their current situation. Torres reflected on the idea that if Kali was truly committed to changing himself, there was no need to bother him. He'd grown tired of Kali's constant begging and realized that everyone had their own path to follow. Meanwhile, Kali was in a corner of the training room, working diligently on his own. He had noticed that his ribs were now fully healed, and he had gained some muscle through consistent exercise. Someone approached him, mentioning that it had been a while since he had seen Kali outside the training ground. Kijo asked Kali if winning easily was fun, to which Kali replied with a simple statement about avoiding injuries being his main concern. Kijo teased him, implying that he would go easy on Kali, but Kali corrected him, emphasizing that it would be troublesome if he got hurt. This response angered Kiyo, and he launched a punch at Kali, who skillfully dodged it. Kali avoided Kiyo's attacks and managed to counter, landing a hit on Kijo's jaw. Kijo coughed up blood and slowly fell, realizing that he had underestimated Kali. Kali recognized that Kiyo's height and reach were significant advantages, but noted that Kijo's large movements and bent swings didn't fully utilize his reach. This made Kiyo vulnerable, and essentially a big punching bag. Kali understood that he needed to maintain the pressure and not give Kyo any breaks during their encounter. As Kali continued to exchange punches with Kijo, he noticed two more men suddenly appearing behind him, ready to attack. This surprised Kali, but he managed to avoid their attacks while wondering if all three of them were going to come at him together. Kijo criticized Kali for relying on a lucky punch, frustrating Kali, who questioned if Kijo was resorting to numbers because he felt at a disadvantage. This remark enraged Kijo, who attempted to punch Kali again, but Kali skillfully avoided it. Unfortunately, another man attacked Kali from behind, making it clear that they were willing to gang up on him to protect their pride. Kali fell to the ground, looking up at them and recalling that he hadn't been much different from them before. Torres couldn't stand the situation any longer and confronted Kijo, asking why he was making a fool of himself in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He mentioned that if Kijo wanted to gang up on someone, he should have done it from the start. Puzzled by Torres' intervention, someone asked why he was on Kali's side. But Torres clarified that he wasn't taking sides. He was simply annoyed by the guy who had lost to Kali and was now causing trouble. Kijo shouted that he hadn't truly lost and had just let his guard down for a moment. Torres challenged Kiyo to have a one-on-one -on -one fight again, with Torres acting as the referee. Kijo confidently accepted the challenge, but as he exchanged menacing glances with Torres, he began to doubt whether Kali was really as inexperienced as he appeared to be. Kiyo attacked Kali but Kali easily avoided his slow punches and pointed out that Kijo was wasting unnecessary movements. Kali continued to punch Kiyo's side, and when Kiyo raised his fist to retaliate, Kali told him to shut up and easily dodged Kijo's attacks. He remarked that Kiyo was only revealing his weaknesses and then launched a punch at Kijo's face, making him dizzy and causing him to collapse to the ground face first. Torres observed Kali and noticed that he had the demeanor of an experienced boxer. He remembered that Kali's father had been a champion, which indicated that Kali likely had some talent. When Kali called out to Torres and asked if he didn't hate him, Torres just turned around and told him that they had nothing to do with each other, instructing Kali to get lost. After this incident, the other apprentices stopped blatantly picking on Kali, implicitly acknowledging that he was one of the boxing apprentices. Meanwhile, in the reception room of the August Mansion, 
Gadolf reassured someone not to worry and to proceed with the match as usual. After the conversation with Gadolf, Nixar walked inside and reminded Gadolf that he had advised against accepting the match because they only had apprentice boxers on their side. Gadolf responded angrily, questioning if Nixar could stand by and accept defeat. He insisted that they might have a chance to win if they performed well in the match. Nixar explained to Gadolf that there were two ways to handle the situation, either prepare the best team and fight competitively or send out a sacrificial team for the next round. However, Gadolf was determined to proceed with the match and ordered Nixar to select the best three apprentices for the fight expressing his desire to witness Baron Doraman's frustration. Nixar couldn't help but feel frustrated by Gadolf's decisions, realizing that Gadolf's actions were jeopardizing the training center, especially if promising boxers like Torres were injured. He also noted that they had only three days left to train the selected apprentices for the upcoming match. Later, Nixar called Torres, Kijo, and Kali to inform them that he had decided to train them and put them in a match against Doraman's training camp in three days. He chose them because they were considered the best by him and the other instructors. Torres asked Nixar if he believed their team would win, and Nixar hesitated, thinking about Godolf, before admitting that they had a very small chance of winning. Kiyo expressed his concerns about the potential consequences of losing the match, asking if they would be seriously injured. Nixar assured them that Godolf wouldn't let them die since they were his property, but he acknowledged that their opponents could still cause injuries. When Kiyo inquired if Nixar had called them because he believed they could win, Nixar simply told Torres that he would spar repeatedly with the other instructors to gain more experience in the next three days. Torres accepted this plan, and Nixar advised Kyo to work on his fear and mental strength. Finally, Kali mentioned to Nixar that he needed someone to assist with his training, as he had been selected due to his recent improvements, and he wanted a specific training plan. Torres was in the middle of a training session and receiving punches from someone. The instructor advised him not to hold back, emphasizing that no matter how strong their opponents were, when Torres landed his punches, they would fall. He urged Torres to act like a winner, even if he felt weak or shaky, to make the opponent believe he was an indomitable force. The instructor suggested taking a break and continuing later. During the training session, Torres noticed Kali on the side and wondered what he was doing in the training field. Meanwhile, a laborer named Valkyrie approached Kali and questioned his sanity, asking if he really intended to throw the stone. Callie encouraged Valkyrie to go ahead and throw it, not reacting to the provocation. Valkyrie threw the stone at Callie, who easily avoided it, showcasing his reflexes. Callie understood that his physical strength couldn't improve significantly in just three days, so he planned to focus on refining his footwork, weaving, and reflexes, which were crucial in boxing. Later, Callie caught a stone being thrown at him and praised Valkyrie for doing a good job. He considered sharpening his body's reflexes as a form of training for boxers. Afterward, Callie arrived at their room and heard someone shouting about killing them all, with others trying to calm down a man named Valky. Callie was surprised by the situation and asked what was happening. Valky angrily told him that he wouldn't forgive Baron Dorman. Callie asked Kiyo for an explanation, and Kiyo replied that they didn't know what was happening either. Callie urged Kijo to find out the truth, considering it a serious situation. Kijo explained that fighters from Dorman's training camp had come and mercilessly beaten them because they were angry about the upcoming match. However, there were no severe injuries, only bruises. Valky shouted his anger at Dorman and his fighters. Just then, Nixar appeared and shouted at Valky, expressing his anger and frustration. He slapped Valky and scolded him, reminding him that if they lost, it would be over for them. Nixar pointed out that Valky had already lost a fight and encouraged everyone to become stronger than their opponents from that moment onward. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Ashwin759 who commented, Please bro third episode on this Manhua PLZ and thanks for your efforts on our Count Sun video. Thanks for commenting. As the days passed, something unexpected had happened to Kali. After spending rigorous training sessions and sharing living quarters with his fellow trainees, he found that he had developed a deep bond with them. It dawned on him that the upcoming fight wasn't merely an event for the citizens, but it had transformed into a battle for the pride of their training camp. Three days later, the clash between the two training camps was set to take place at the August Estate Arena. As Callie observed the buzzing crowd in the stands, he couldn't help but notice that it seemed like half of the estate's residents had gathered there to witness this epic showdown. Meanwhile, their trainer, Nixar, held a calm demeanor as he instructed Kijo, Torres, and Kali about the herbal tea in their hands. He explained that it would help relax them and provide them with the strength they needed. Nixar also shared some words of wisdom, advising them that if they believed they were going to lose, they should raise two fingers high as a sign of surrender. He emphasized that it was better to have their pride hurt than to become crippled by an overwhelming defeat. With the crowd's anticipation building, 
Nixar revealed the order of the match. Kyo would go first, followed by Torres and then Kali. He directed Kyo to get ready, which caused Kyo to spit out his tea in a fit of nervousness. He questioned if he was really going to be the first one in the ring. Without hesitation, Nixar simply pushed him into the ring, urging him to perform well and return victorious. Kali called out to Kyo, noticing his extreme nervousness. He asked him why he was so tense and advised him not to let his opponent get too close. However, Kijo's frustration got the best of him, and he questioned Kali, stating that they needed to be close to their opponents to land hits. The host announced Kijo's entrance into the ring, eliciting cheers from the crowd. As the audience watched Kijo's entry, they couldn't help but wonder about his height when he was still an apprentice, which added to Kijo's anxiety. The host continued by introducing Kijo's opponent, Bass, a seasoned warrior from the Dorman Training Center with 14 wins under his belt. Bass wasted no time in taunting Kijo, referring to him as a kid and remarking that having long limbs didn't necessarily make one strong. This further shook Kijo's confidence, and he nervously trembled. On the other side of the arena, Torres and Kali expressed their concerns for Kijo. Joshua, another member of their camp, laughed heartily, commenting on Kijo's height but still considering him just a kid. Baron Josh of the Doraman camp teased Gadolf, asking for his opinion, but Gadolf, although angered, believed that the real match had yet to begin. As the tension in the arena reached its peak, the host finally announced the start of the match. Bas wasted no time and immediately lunged at Kijo, launching an aggressive attack. The crowd watched with bated breath as Bas threw a punch at Kijo, but Kijo managed to skillfully dodge it. He continued to evade another attack from Bas, who sported a confident smile and seemed eager to engage. Despite Kicho's efforts to avoid the blows, frustration began to bubble up in the audience. They questioned whether Kicho was truly a real man, and if they had come to witness such a timid performance. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. Kijo continued to punch Boss, taking advantage of the situation, while the crowd loudly cheered for him. Kali observed that Kijo was now more flexible and faster, having reduced unnecessary muscle stress, making his attacks even more threatening. Kijo's agility and speed were on full display, as his attack style resembled that of Amantis. Bas, his opponent, was prepared to retaliate, but Kao's height posed a significant challenge. It was hard for Bas to mount a defense against Kao's reach advantage. Bas realized that he needed to hit Kijo harder than Kijo was hitting him to secure victory. However, Kijo skillfully avoided Bas's attacks and wore a confident smile, knowing he had the upper hand. Kijo launched his fist into the open space on Bass's face, delivering a powerful blow that sent Bass tumbling to the ground in defeat. The crowd erupted in thunderous cheers, leaving Kijo both surprised and overwhelmed. He immediately searched the audience for Nixar, and upon seeing Nixar nodding and smiling, Kijo raised his hand with tears of joy in his eyes and jubilantly shouted that he had won, prompting even more cheers from the spectators. Gadolf teased Dorman about their apprentice's remarkable victory and asked if Dorman had witnessed it. Dorman responded with a mixture of frustration and admiration, reminding Gadolf that they still had two fighters left to compete. Gadolf instructed Valky to convey a message to Nixar, emphasizing the dire consequences of losing and mentioning the threat of sending the losers to the mine. Valky delivered Gadolf's message, leaving Nixar frustrated. Nixar then informed Kali and Torres about Gadolf's threat assuring them that he would try to persuade Gadolf later. He suggested that if they ever felt in danger, they should surrender immediately. However, Torres, displaying unwavering confidence, declared that there was no need for Nixar to persuade Gadolf because he was determined to win. Kali noticed Torres's determination, but also realized that Torres's opponent, Molga, was on a different level than Bass. Soon, Torres and Molga faced each other in the ring. Molga offered Torres some advice, acknowledging that he was different from Bass, and suggested that Torres give up to avoid getting seriously hurt. Torres responded by telling Molga not to say anything and boldly challenged him to fight. When the referee initiated the match, both fighters immediately launched their fists at each other. The audience, including Kali, was shocked to see both Torres and Molga landing simultaneous punches on each other, resulting in blood being splattered around the ring. Unfortunately for Torres, Molga's strength proved superior, pushing him back. Despite the odds, Torres managed to hold his ground and continued to exchange punches with Molga, creating an exhilarating and tense moment for the audience. With a determined <laughs> smile, Torres asked Molga how many hits he had taken, trying to project confidence even as he stood on the verge of exhaustion. Molga acknowledged that Torres was used to facing more active fighters, 
but was determined not to let him win. With fierce resolve, Molga launched another attack, deliberately using his elbow to strike Torres, which resulted in Torres bleeding from his head. An infuriated Torres confronted Molga, accusing him of cheating with the elbow strike. However, Molga brushed it off, claiming it was an accidental outcome that often occurred during matches. Despite this, Torres wiped the blood from his head and replied with a reluctant, Okay, all the while seething about how the situation had unfolded. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. Swords or spears? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. In the end, Torres won with a swift uppercut to Molga's jaw. Next up was Kali versus Burrito. Burrito, still angry, launched another attack on Kali. But Kali noticed that Burrito always used the right jab. As a result, he easily and quickly avoided it. Then, he observed that Burrito's next attack was a left hook, followed by a right uppercut, and Kali skillfully evaded all of them. He remembered Valky asking him why he was avoiding these punches, but he retorted by asking Valky if he wanted him to get hit all the time. Kali pointed out the fragility of his body, explaining that if he got hit by those punches, he'd break into pieces. Valky tried to clarify his intentions, and Kali explained that he intended to avoid the punches while waiting for the perfect time to strike. This response left Valky confused, and he inquired about what Kali meant by the perfect time. Kali elaborated, stating that it involved watching his opponent's movements and analyzing their patterns. He had figured out that Burrito would first prepare his foot for a step, then adjust his upper body for a punch. Kali scrutinized Burrito's shoulder, chest, and waist, waiting for the precise moment when Burrito was ready to launch an attack. Kali admitted that he didn't know if his fragile body could endure the hit, but he was confident that his experience and body sense would help him secure victory. With newfound determination, Kali punched Burrito in the face, causing Burrito's nose to bleed. He swiftly followed up with a punch to Burrito's cheek, not giving Burrito a chance to recover. The audience, along with Nixar and the Masters, couldn't believe that Kali had managed to hit Burrito for the second time. Valky, too, was surprised, impressed by Kali's ability to analyze patterns. Meanwhile, Burrito remained on his knees, bewildered by how Kali had managed to land two consecutive hits. In his mind, Kali urged Burrito not to stand up, as he couldn't use his right hand anymore and suggested that he should give up, allowing them to move forward. However, Burrito furiously slammed his hand on the ground and stood up, hurling insults at Kali and leaving himself in a position of frustration. Burrito sneered at Kali, calling him a rat and boasting that he would crush him without Kali even realizing it. Unbeknownst to Kali, Burrito had concealed sand in his hand and suddenly hurled it into his eyes. Kali, temporarily blinded, tried to open his eyes, but the pain was excruciating. In that moment, Burrito seized the opportunity and punched Kali in the face, sending him flying into the distance. Burrito taunted him, labeling him as nasty. Despite the setback, Kali stood up with his eyes still closed and faced Burrito once more. Burrito charged toward him, shouting that it was the end, but Kali remained composed, knowing he needed to stay calm because his analysis was already complete. He anticipated Burrito's moves, knowing that Burrito always started with a right jab. With sheer determination, Kali launched his fist toward Burrito and struck him in the face with all his might, causing Burrito to bleed and slowly fall. Burrito collapsed to the ground, defeated. The referee initiated the countdown, and when the referee reached zero and Burrito didn't stand up, Kali raised his hand in victory and jubilantly shouted, leaving Azalea in shock. Doraman patted Kali on the head and proudly exclaimed that he couldn't believe they had won. Meanwhile, Doraman, whose pride had been shattered, swiftly departed from the territory. Godolf, who felt immense joy, rewarded them with three whole pigs. Two months later, during the harvest season, Keo placed a box of vegetables on the ground and angrily questioned whether they were farmers or fighters. Kali reassured Kijo, telling him that he was complaining too much and should view it as strength training. As for Kali, his body had undergone many changes. Moments later, he placed the last box of vegetables on the table, and the farmer smiled, commending him for a job well done. The farmer suggested that they take some vegetables with them, to which Kali expressed her gratitude. The farmer then asked if they were planning to attend the harvest festival of Duke Wesley, and Kicho replied negatively, explaining that they were still apprentices and had to wait another year to participate. The farmer expressed regret as he wanted to see their matches again. Kijo responded by asking if the farmer was silly and elaborated that the highlight of the Harvest Festival was boxing, and their master happened to be one of the Duke's relatives. Kijo continued the conversation, mentioning that Doraman and August were currently competing under his sponsorship, with Doraman having the upper hand at the moment. He pretended to ponder and then teasingly asked Kali if he'd been hit on the head hard before, lightening the mood. Kali glanced back at the mansion, realizing that a whole year had passed since their journey began. Meanwhile, in August's mansion reception room, Nixar attempted to persuade Godolf to give him one more year, 
He explained that the last match had been well prepared, but luck had been on their side. In response, Gadolf mentioned that a letter had arrived from the Duke's house. They must have heard about their recent victory, and the Duke wanted to see the three apprentices. Gadolf emphasized that refusing the Duke's invitation wouldn't be in their best interest. Nixar understood the significance of Duke Wesley's stature as one of the five Dukes in the kingdom, and acknowledged that they couldn't possibly refuse such an invitation. He replied, I understand. Godolf informed him that they would depart for the Duke's house with an escort the day after tomorrow, so they should start getting ready. Those three were now official boxers, so Godolf needed to mark them accordingly. A moment later, Kali felt that the mark on his shoulder was still sore, but he shrugged it off, knowing that as long as he could box, the discomfort didn't matter. They resumed their journey, and suddenly someone congratulated Callie for becoming an official boxer. Azelia told him that thanks to him she could walk alongside the nobles. Callie asked her if she was talking about him, and she replied affirmatively, for which he thanked her. Azelia's gaze lingered on him, leaving him somewhat puzzled. Then she told him that he had changed a lot and should showcase his training results at the Harvest Festival. Kijo chimed in, asking if Azelia's appearance didn't qualify as pretty highlighting her red hair and full lips as signs of her beauty, even from a distance. Kali remembered her expressions and realized that she was indeed quite pretty. Torres cautioned Kiyo to watch his mouth unless he wanted to incur their master's anger, but Kijo playfully suggested that Torres might actually like him. This remark infuriated Torres, and he attacked Kiyo from behind. Kiyo chuckled and told Torres that he got the message. The knights accompanying them told them to be quiet, and as night fell, the captain of the knights instructed everyone to stop for a break and then continue on their journey. Hio, irritated by the bugs sticking to him, asked why they were going around the mountain. Hio complained about the rainstorm causing the bridge to collapse, prompting Kiyo to reply with a wry smile. Who would have known? Kiyo raised a critical question, asking what they should do if bandits were to show up. Inside the carriage, Gadolf advised Azelia that the sun sets quickly in the mountains, so she should get some rest first. Gadolf then turned to the captain of the knights and mentioned that they would be departing early the next morning. The knight responded, explaining that it was harvest season and bandits were rampant, urging them to hurry. Godolf, however, questioned the captain, asking if it wasn't because of these bandits that he paid them. As they were engaged in conversation, a rustling sound caught their attention. Heo shouted that something was moving in the bushes, prompting Godolf to inquire about what it was and where they thought they were going. Suddenly, someone hurled something at the captain of the knights, and a barrage of sharp arrows flew in their direction. Kali panicked, recognizing it as an attack and the knight immediately shielded him. Nixar, who had been hiding in the bushes, called out to them, urging them to come closer. However, he noticed that the arrow shower had ceased, replaced by a growing number of bandits approaching them. Nixar told Kali that they didn't have enough soldiers, so if he unlocked their chains, they would fight alongside him. Torres and Kijo readily agreed to this plan. Nixar retrieved the key to their chains and freed them, emphasizing that their priority was to subdue the approaching bandits and protect Gadolf and Azelia. In the midst of the chaos, one of the bandits attacked Kijo with a sword, shouting that he had found them. Fortunately, Kijo managed to block the attack with the chain on his wrist and swiftly punched the assailant in the face. He instructed the others not to stand around and to follow Torres. Torres wrapped the chain around his arm, calling Kali a crazy bastard, and Kijo retorted that Kali was definitely not an ordinary guy. Meanwhile, Kali was racing toward the carriage, realizing that he needed to find Godolf and Azelia. The knights apprehended Godolf, who struggled to free himself from their grasp, but the knight reminded him that they needed to move quickly. Godolf then realized that Godolf was safe. However, Godolf suddenly shouted that Azelia was still inside the carriage, startling Kali. He immediately sprinted toward the carriage, but noticed that one of the bandits was already approaching it. He shouted at the man to stop, but the man simply smiled and swung his sword at Kali. Fortunately, Kali managed to block the attack using the chain on his arm, but the force of the blow threw him to the ground. He realized that the bandit possessed formidable strength. The bandit then opened the carriage door, causing Azelia to cry out in fear, which Kali could hear. The bandit emerged from the carriage, carrying a collapsed Azelia in his arms. When he saw that Azelia wasn't moving, he shouted in distress and anxiously called her name. The bandit then swiftly ran away with Azelia in his grasp. Gadolf urgently demanded that the knights assist Azelia, but to his dismay, the knight remained stationary but Kali informed Godolf that he would return shortly. A few minutes later, the bandit holding Azelia ran toward a cliff, despite Kali's pleas to stop and the apparent lack of anywhere else to go. The bandit eventually set Azelia down and remarked that Godolf looked like a slave. He pointed his sword at Kali while inquiring if Kali wanted to join them. Kali, baffled by the bandit's actions, questioned why he would recruit someone by pointing a sword at them. He warned the bandit that joining him would likely lead to nothing more than a life of banditry. The bandit readied himself, 
declaring that it was the end of the story. Callie recognized the bandit's fighting stance and asked if he was a gladiator. The bandit confirmed this and boasted of having 42 wins to his name, realizing that a direct confrontation would be nearly impossible. Callie contemplated whether to fight the bandit or attempt to evade him. When the bandit swung his blade at Callie, Callie agilely dodged the attack and swiftly made his way toward Azealia, catching the bandit off guard. He told the bandit that he pitied him because he had no intention of engaging in combat and in a daring move, jumped off the cliff with Azealia in his arms. They plunged into the ocean, leaving the lone bandit staring after them. Moments later, Callie called out to Azealia to wake up and was relieved to see her breathing. She gradually opened her eyes, sitting up in shock, which brought a sense of relief to Gadolf. He inquired if she was all right. A few minutes later, he recounted the events that had transpired. Azealia revealed that she vividly remembered the one-eyed man who had struck her, while reflecting on the fact that he had never expected to use the camouflage techniques he learned in the military. Callie suggested they at least light a fire. However, Azealia pointed out that it wasn't possible due to the damp trees and they risked being discovered. She called him incompetent, and he was taken aback when he noticed her trembling from the cold. He realized her body temperature had dropped significantly due to the wet clothes and suggested that she remove them to avoid catching a cold. Her reaction surprised him as she asked if he was telling her to undress and referred to him as a shameless bastard. Callie reassured Azealia that he didn't mean it in any inappropriate way when suggesting she remove her wet clothes. He explained that it was simply a matter of survival to avoid freezing to death and promised to turn his back. She teasingly remarked that he had become quite bold, to which he responded that it was because he needed to protect her, fearing Gadolf's wrath if anything happened to her. Azelia warned him not to look back, threatening to kill him if he did, and he agreed to her terms. In truth, his head was spinning as he heard her undressing. He asked if she felt less cold, but she still shivered from the chill. Callie noticed that even though he was freezing, he could see his lips turning blue, and his body trembled from the cold. He explained that there were two ways to warm up, either move their bodies to raise their body temperature or stick together. She hesitated for a moment but eventually agreed. Callie put his arm around her, surprising her, and she shyly asked what he was doing. He reminded her of their need to stay close to generate warmth, as it was a method soldiers used during winter marches. He acknowledged that she might not like it, but he emphasized the importance of keeping each other warm to prevent any harm. She silently sat next to him, accepting the situation. The next morning, Callie assessed that it seemed safe in their current location and asked if she could walk. She wondered if he planned to carry her if she couldn't, revealing that she was still putting up a tough front. Her stomach growled with hunger, and she shyly admitted that she couldn't help it because she hadn't eaten since the previous night. Later, near a river, Callie offered her some food, which he had caught from the river. Initially disgusted by the idea of eating raw fish, she reluctantly accepted a piece. However, after tasting it, her expression changed and she found it surprisingly palatable. They continued their journey, and Callie informed her that if they headed upstream, they could eventually rejoin their group. She expressed concern about encountering the bandits first, but he casually remarked that they would leave it to luck, which made her call him irresponsible. Callie reassured her that he always did his best, and added that he was simply wishing her luck. Zelia found Callie to be different from a typical boy or a slave. He was enigmatic and seemed to learn things in his unique way. Shyly, she commented that the more she got to know him, the more mysterious he became. When he asked if she had said something, she told him to keep looking straight ahead as they continued their journey. Meanwhile, a furious man was seething because he had been attempting to secure a ransom, but that persistent young man had reappeared. He swore that he would kill him if he ever saw him again. Suddenly, the man heard approaching footsteps from behind, prompting him to stand up immediately. Someone informed him that they would meet the soldiers soon. The man parted the tall grass in front of him and saw Azalea and Callie. Azalea commented that it was the third time she had heard that particular sound. The man saw this as a heaven-sent opportunity. Callie and Azalea were both surprised to hear someone suggest that even tigers would come if they were called. The man addressed Callie, remarking that it was nice to meet him. Callie faced the man to protect Azalea, and the man asked if Callie planned to fight him without even a weapon calling him a laughable bastard. The man was taken aback when Callie confidently declared that he would kill him and claim a special prize. The man taunted Azalea, asking her why she hadn't engaged in conversation with him before he sold her, causing her to tremble in fear. Callie retorted that the man was aiming too high and questioned who had said he was going to let him take Azalea. Callie believed that the chains had floated away when he fell into the river, making it impossible to rely on them. The man mockingly called him a little boy and suggested they take him down first. The man swung his sword toward Callie, and Callie narrowly avoided it, but it managed to cut his hair and clothes. The man commented on Callie's speed and taunted him about how long he could keep evading. The man continued to attack Callie with his sword, and Callie deftly avoided each strike. However, when the man unexpectedly turned his body, 
and delivered a kick. Callie didn't anticipate it and was sent crashing to the ground. Azalea anxiously shouted a warning to him. Callie was surprised to find the sword dangerously close to his face, but managed to roll aside just in time to avoid it. He swiftly got back on his feet, realizing that the sword possessed both high killing power and long reach. Knowing that against an opponent armed with long arms, guns, and knives, his only chance of winning with bare hands was to move forward, Callie decided to summon the courage to face the blade head-on. The man teasingly remarked that Callie understood he was sticking his neck out, but Azalea knew that the man was mistaken. The man swung his sword at Callie again, who leaped to the side to dodge the attack, finding an opening. Callie seized the opportunity to punch the man's side, causing him to growl in pain. Undeterred, the man swung his blade in anger, shouting that they should take it to the end. Callie jumped backward to evade the strike, recognizing that he needed the bravery to confront the blade. During the exchange, Callie's nose was lightly cut by the sword. Callie was well aware that he needed determination to move forward in this intense battle. Once again, the man swung his sword in Callie's direction, but Callie skillfully jumped to the side, aiming for the man's blind spot. He capitalized on this opportunity and landed a powerful punch to the man's jaw, causing him to cough up blood. Callie then immediately grabbed the man's shoulder and forcefully slammed him onto the ground, eliciting painful shouts from the man. Callie didn't relent. He continued to strike the man, punching him in the face, delivering elbow blows, and relentlessly pummeling him until he was exhausted and unable to move. Callie finally leaned against a nearby tree, catching his breath while the man lay badly beaten near another tree. The man still attempted to reach for his sword, swearing that he would definitely kill Callie. Suddenly, a shadow appeared in front of the man and seized his sword. Panicked, the man tried to react, but Azalea lifted the sword and declared that the man had tried to disgrace her. She then decisively stabbed the man with the sword, leaving Callie surprised. Shakenly, Azalea expressed that even killing the man a hundred times would not be enough, which left Callie stunned, realizing that Azalea was not a typical noble. After dealing with the boss of the bandits, they were eventually found by a rescue team and able to return safely. Nixar, who was applying ointment to Callie's cut, informed him that he was lucky because if the cut had been a little higher, he could have been blinded. Callie teasingly remarked that he now looked more manly and nice. Suddenly, someone called out to Callie and he was surprised when Godolf thanked him for saving his daughter. Callie couldn't believe that a slave like himself was being thanked by a noble. Callie replied that it was his duty. Godolf then instructed him to sit down and rest, making it clear that it was in order. He believed that Callie deserved it and had every right to do so. Godolf expressed his frustration with the knights, stating that they didn't know what even a young slave like him knew while glaring at the knights behind him. Godolf then asked if there were any secrets to his victory against the gladiator. The man replied that it helped to appear weak because their opponents would always underestimate them. They successfully rescued Azalea from the bandits and earned their loyalty. They were eventually able to ride in a carriage, and their journey led them to Duke Wesley. Duke Wesley greeted Godolf cheerfully, remarking that it had been a long time since they had seen each other, and acknowledging the long journey they had undertaken. Godolf expressed his gratitude to Duke Wesley, who noticed Azalea's presence and remarked that she had grown into a lady who resembled her mother. Azalea replied humbly, expressing her honor that he remembered her. However, before that, she informed Duke Wesley that one of the servants was ill in bed, so Callie had to serve in their place. She believed that Callie was the best fit for the role because the others had less suitable appearances and bulky bodies that couldn't be made into proper servants. Shortly after, the nobles were seated at a long table, and Duke Wesley inquired if it was true that August had won all three matches in the last boxing event, noting that he had heard they were all apprentices. Callie replied feeling a bit embarrassed, that it was indeed the case, and those apprentices had now become official boxers. As the nobles engaged in their conversations, Azalea began to feel left out and bored. She sighed and whispered something to her father, then ordered Callie to follow her. Callie was surprised by her request, but replied with a simple, yes. They soon found themselves on the streets of the city, and Azalea expressed her feeling of suffocation and how she didn't want to attend in the first place. She mentioned her father's obsession with finding her a husband, and asked Callie if he thought it was horrible to be tied down at such a young age. Callie assured her that his opinion didn't matter. Azalea then spotted two candies and offered one to Callie, inquiring if he had ever tasted one before. Callie realized that he hadn't eaten anything sweet except fruits since arriving in this world. He put the lollipop in his mouth and admitted that it was delicious. Azalea smiled and reminded him that she had told him so, to which he shyly agreed. Observing an old woman staring at him, Callie wondered why she was doing so. The old woman approached Azalea and asked if she could read her fortune. Callie suggested that they should leave, but Azalea was intrigued by the idea, finding it fun, 
As she had never had her fortune read before, she insisted they go and see what the old woman had to say, and they followed her with the promise of a reasonable price. Azalea excitedly identified the place as a gypsy tent, something she had only heard about before. Meanwhile, Callie was still wondering what the old woman was up to. The old woman began by telling Azalea that her life wouldn't be a smooth sailing one, and that there would be many twists and turns. Azalea responded positively, saying that she found it good because a predictable life would be boring. She then asked the old woman to look into her marriage, or love fortune, leaving Godolf a bit bewildered. The old woman proceeded to read Azalea's love fortune, and mentioned that her partner might be close by, but she wouldn't have the love that everyone blesses her with. This made Azalea blush, and left Callie even more confused about the whole fortune-telling process. Next, the old woman offered to read Callie's fortune for free, and initially, he declined, stating that he was fine. However, the old woman insisted that he shouldn't be cold and that it wouldn't cost him anything. Callie finally agreed and sat down as the old woman began to read his fortune using a crystal ball. The old woman sighed and told Callie that he had come from a very far away place, a location that people there couldn't even imagine. This revelation shocked Callie, and he asked the old woman where he came from. However, the old woman explained that she didn't know that she could only convey what she saw. Zalea inquired about what the old woman saw, and she replied that she saw a metal object flying in the sky, a carriage moving without a horse, and a human inside a box. This description left Callie in disbelief, and made him wonder if the old woman had glimpsed his past. The old woman mentioned that there was an unusual energy surrounding Callie, and it seemed like he had an angel by his side. Azalea suggested that his fortune might have played a role in his success as a fighter. However, Callie dismissed it as superstition, and advised Azalea not to believe in such things. Azalea pouted and reminded him that she also knew it was just superstition, warning him not to cross the line because he was just a slave. Panicking, Callie apologized to Azalea, while the old woman couldn't believe that someone with his energy had ended up as a slave. She sensed that he wouldn't remain a slave for long. Within three days, he would need to sow Azalea's anger and return to the slave dorm. As he headed back, Callie had hoped to start his training soon, but the knights in the dorm teased him about being a real fighter due to his skinny appearance. They even dared him to crawl under a knight's foot, while another laughed heartily. Frustrated, Callie asked if any of them had ever been hit by a fighter, and told them to stop picking a fight with him. One of the knights, offended by his words, asked how a slave like him dared to be arrogant, and then launched a spear at him. The situation took a different turn when someone shouted at the knight to stop and questioned what they were doing. The knights were stunned to see Duke Wesley behind Callie. Wesley scolded the knights, asking them how a slave could enter a citizen's place like this. He mentioned that Callie belonged to his customer, Baron Gadolf, and asked if they wanted to stain his own face. The knights were left fearful and didn't know how to respond to the Duke's presence. Wesley then approached Callie and expressed his surprise that Callie was one of the fighters who defeated Dorman's fighter. He touched Callie's body and commented on his strong shoulder muscles, further acknowledging Callie's identity as a fighter. However, Wesley quickly shifted his tone, apologizing for getting too excited and assuring Callie that he'd stop bothering him. Wesley then mentioned that they would meet at the match and walked away, leaving Callie in a state of confusion. Later, back at the accommodation for the slaves and fighters, Callie was engaged in training and feeling frustrated, Tors teasingly asked him if he enjoyed living in the castle for three days, to which Callie replied that he was dying of frustration. Nixar informed them that the training area they were in was not just Doraman's slave fighter training camp, but also included stray fighters. He explained that if they were lucky, they might not have to fight and could avoid the matches, but they were far from ready to face the other fighters gathered there. Torres questioned Nixar if he expected him to stay idle in the training camp when he was eager to win everything. Nixar, frustrated, kicked Torres in the stomach and expressed his anger, warning Torres not to joke around. He emphasized the fact that many boxers had won dozens of times in a row, resulting in dozens of buried boxers. Nixar warned Torres that if it weren't for the matches, they might end up dead, so he needed to take things seriously. Torres apologized and assured Nixar that he understood the gravity of the situation. The situation escalated when they heard someone shout that Doraman's ogre had arrived. Nixar and the others turned around to see a massive man in the center of a group of people. Nixar expressed shock and noted that Doraman had sharpened his sword for the ogre, indicating that the ogre was a formidable fighter. Kajo, filled with fear, asked what the huge guy was and if he was even human. Nixar explained that people called him an ogre because he was considered considered at the same level as a monster. They discussed the ogre's impressive record of 76 wins in a year, fighting three to four times a day. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at UserGR6VT1GW7X who commented, The best skill is blood manipulation where you can control anyone's blood 
And also, when you cut her skin and blood comes out, you can turn it into a sword or a blade or anything. Imagine it like Akira on our SSS Rank Hunter video. Thanks for commenting. Nixar also mentioned rumors that ogres could rip someone's ribs off with their bare hands reinforcing the ogre's fearsome reputation. Kiyo expressed concern about their safety, worried that they might die if they had to face the ogre in a match. Nixar reassured them, saying that their master believed it was too early for them to fight the ogre. There was a possibility they wouldn't have to face him. Tower found the situation interesting, and remarked that the ogre's nickname didn't seem like an exaggeration. Kiyo, still fearful, tried to make light of the situation, and asked if any of them wanted to fight the ogre. Kali, however, expressed doubt about being able to defeat the ogre due to the significant size difference and considered how he might approach such a fight. Kyo questioned their sanity and wondered if they really wanted to face the ogre, noticing that Kali sometimes displayed a different, more primal side. Later, the nobles gathered in front of the task board to check the match schedule, indicating that preparations for the upcoming matches were underway. Doriman and Godolf exchanged words about the upcoming match with the ogre. Doriman teased Godolf about the difficulty of facing the ogre, but Godolf took it lightly and told Doriman that they would see each other at the match. Nixar praised Godolf for not falling for Doriman's provocation, knowing that fighting the ogre was a dangerous proposition. Godolf also acknowledged that Doriman was serious this time as he had made his three fighters face the ogre in the past. Nixar expressed concern about their chances against the ogre, understanding that it was essentially a death sentence for any fighter. Godolf mentioned that they had come to check the match schedule, prompting Nixar to inform him of the schedule. Torres was scheduled to fight on the first day, while Kali and Kijo were set to fight on the second day. The ogre was also scheduled for the first day, which raised concerns about the other Baron's fighter who would face the ogre. On the first day of the match at Wiry Stadium, terrified man faced the enormous ogre. He begged the ogre not to come closer and retreated, inadvertently cornering himself inside the ring. The ogre, with a menacing glare, launched a punch at the man, who luckily managed to duck and evade the blow. However, as he cautiously looked back, he saw that the ring pillar had been obliterated. Dorman scolded the ogre for being a troublemaker and asked him not to destroy the pillar. Kali remarked to Kijo that he understood why the man had earned the nickname Ogre. The ogre didn't seem human at all. The terrified man, overwhelmed with fear, attempted to surrender and let the ogre win, but the ogre ignored his plea and continued his relentless attack. The crowd cheered for the ogre, reveling in the brutality of the fight. Kali had witnessed many deaths in fights before, but this gruesome spectacle was beyond anything he had seen. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.